Hello, and welcome to CommittedWife.com. My name is Tiffany Godfrey, and I'm your host. Today I'm here with Ms. Pam Abel. Pam is a leader in her community and throughout the entire country. She and her husband speak for family life marriage conferences and travel extensively, presenting conferences to thousands of couples annually. Their story has been heard on several radio interviews and written up as a chapter in the book entitled, I Still Do. Pam has been published in Decision and Answer magazines, and she lives with her husband in Pennsylvania, and her husband's name is Barry, with whom she's been married for 45 years. She has two adult children, and she is the proud grandmother of six. Pam's passion in life is bringing encouragement and hope to marriages and families. And today we're going to discuss a very important aspect of marriage, sex and intimacy. Many times women allow our emotions, we allow our emotions, fatigue, our thought life, and daily activities to hinder and deprive us from enjoying a sexually fulfilling marriage. How can we learn to work on making sex a priority without making it a chore? We have to work on that because God's plan is for it to be an enjoyable part of our marriage relationship. So Pam, thank you so much for talking with us today. Oh, it's great to be here with you, Tiffany. Thank you for including me. All right. Well, let's start. What is the difference between sex and intimacy? That's a great question. I think it really boils down to the fact that sex is really the physical act. But intimacy, I like to think of as into me see. And this emotional connection, which is so important, especially for a woman, is what we need in our sexual relationship. So it's a little bit more than just the physical, because you really can get sex from anywhere. You sure can. And <laughs> you can do it anywhere, and but the connection is not there. So that that is mm -hmm. excellent. As a newlywed, was sex really a priority for you? And throughout these 45 years of marriage, how did you learn about the importance of making it a priority if it was not? I, I must be honest with you that for the first 11 or 12 years of our marriage, I had no idea whatsoever beyond the actual physical act uh, of how important it was to my husband or how even my own body worked. I was pretty ignorant, and I just figured we were doing what we were supposed to be doing, but I later was to find out, of course, that we weren't doing it right at all. We weren't communicating. We really were not communicating. Uh, even though we were somewhat educated, I don't know if we were as educated as we should have been. And I remember when we started having children, then things really took a turn for the worst. I mean, my husband still remembers after all these years going six weeks without making love when I had little kids. Now, mm. it's, just, it's just a cruel act. <laughs> I thought it was justified. I I was just as tired. I just never had been so tired in my whole life. And I just the last thing I felt like was, you know, having any sort of sexual relationship. And I had no idea the impact and the hurt and the rejection that my husband would feel. So getting educated, getting some great books to read. You know, one I can recommend is a book called Sexual Intimacy, communicating on this subject, which so many people struggle with. They just don't communicate on it. They find it awkward, uncomfortable, um, and they just do not communicate. Praying about it, just saying, you know, I feel like we're struggling here, or just asking the Lord to help you individually, but including the Lord in your sex life. And just praying about these things, and praying with each other, can make a huge difference. And that is a good point because something that's something that I had to do. Um, a lot of times when that baby comes or those babies come, it changes everything. The time, uh, how much energy you have, and it's just. Right? There are other priorities uh, in your mind than, okay, yeah, sex is great. I know I have to do it. And you may go through the motions, but I don't believe that's what God's plan was. It was for us to have a sexually fulfilling marriage. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, it, we do have to take that initiative to, to do the research because a lot of times, we're not learning it in the church. A lot of times we may be faithful members of a church, and it may be a Bible-believing, faith-filled church where the pastor is happily married, but the talk or the issue of sex within the marriage relationship is not often dealt with. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think the church shies away from discussing the topic of sex within the confines of marriage? You know, it's, it's a great question, and I'm not really sure I have the answer, but I feel, again, it's because they feel this is a private area of people's mm-hmm. lives, that uh, people will feel uncomfortable, that they will feel a bit threatened, that they'll feel uh, that this is just not something for public discussion or biblical teaching. But if you've ever sat under a teaching from the Bible on the Song of Solomon, you will yeah. see that it is very biblical and and that it's been designed by the Lord for us, not only for you know, procreation, but for our pleasure. And so God has some other ideas on this whole idea. And he knows, of course, that men are created very differently in this arena than women. But he did it for a reason. It wasn't an accident. So he's a teaching a man some very important principles and truths in his lovemaking with the, with his wife and his wife's very, very important principles in, in, in making love with her husband. And it's really this idea of putting each other's interests first. It's serving each other, this idea of becoming a servant to one another and putting the other person's needs ahead of your own. And he's teaching us through the sexual act of a really sacrificial love. And um, and the Song of Solomon is just a great way. I mean, you should if you if you're lacking a little pizzazz in your love life, sit down and read a chapter of Song of Solomon together every night and see what happens. <laughs> Excellent. And we talked about the fact of fatigue and um, children and all of these other activities, including the thought life, can take away our interest in sex, but. One thing that we don't talk about often is emotional and mental adultery in the sense of emotional being where you're sharing your deepest innermost feelings with someone of the opposite sex or even you're fantasizing about being with other men. How can that affect a woman's ability or desire to make love to her husband? Oh, big time. We are, you know, women are just... Uh, holistic. Are we take in so much and then our brain just holds it all in and we just are holistic thinkers. So a lot out there is going to affect us. Um, if we get involved in serious soap operas, romance novels, Facebooking with old boyfriends, um, connecting over lunch with a fellow uh, male employee, you know, employee, um, connecting anyway, really, with anybody from the opposite sex for any reason, um, we instantly sort of fall into this romanticizing thing that you mentioned. Um, we begin to think, ah, oh, this person, this person could meet my needs where my husband's not meeting my needs. And you begin to fantasize. And it's just so unrealistic. It's sort of the same issues that men face when they get into pornography, uh, mm. even though more and more women now are entering into pornography, especially into the ages of 35, um, it, it just, it's, what you're doing is you're, you're really committing a mental or emotional act of adultery with another person, even though physically you may not have entered the act, and that's, that's just going to, it's, once you let that in, you know, it can just find its root into your heart. There's a quote I like to make, and it's, you know, watch your thoughts because they can become your words, and watch your words because they can become your actions. Watch your actions because they can become your habits. Watch your habits because they can become your character, and then watch your character because it can become your destiny. 
So your whole mm-hmm. destiny in your marriage can be determined what you're thinking. And it all begins in your thought life, and we have to guard that. And fortunately, Jesus Christ has said that we can come to him in all things, and he will guard our hearts and minds in him. So we need to just shy away from all those other activities out there that are drawing us into relationships with other people and unrealistic expectations. Exactly. Because it's all a mirage. It's 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 a, it's a mirage. It's the steps from the enemy. And that man that you're fantasizing about, he may not have the same issues as your husband, but it'll be something else. It'll be some other thing. And the Bible tells us that we must learn to be content in whatsoever state we're in. It's not to say that you become complacent and don't work on your marriage. Of course, you cannot change your marriage, but prayer does. Prayer can change anything. And when you make the decision, we've talked about that, making the decision to please your husband, to love him despite, to give him love, my husband calls it pity sex, meaning I'm just doing this because It's what we learned in premarital counseling. It's what the Bible says I have to do. But it's Mm -hmm. beyond that because pity sex just tells your husband, I'm just putting up with you. I'm not, you know, it's, it's, I'll do it, but I, I'm really not into this. And so many of us have gone through that. You said you went through that the first 11, 12 years of your marriage. And a lot of it was because you didn't understand your body, who you were. A lot of women, uh, myself included, had been sexually abused as a child and mm-hmm. was very promiscuous as a young woman. So I think even when when the enemy sees you trying to become intimate, he can mm-hmm. use your past if it's undealt with to hinder that because that's the last thing he would want to see in a marriage, a sexually fulfilling marriage where the husband and wife were loving each other and have no desire to go outside of the marriage for whether it's emotional or physical needs. So mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. just so important to work on that. You talked about prayer. You talked about mm-hmm. the book Sexual Intimacy. Now, who is the author of Sexual Intimacy? I knew you were going to ask me that, and I can't think of it offhand, unfortunately. Um, that's okay. But the, uh, there are two other books I can recommend as well, um, and it's by okay. two women, uh, which I don't have in front of me either, but it's Intimate Issues okay. and Intimacy Ignited, and it's by the same authors as well. Um, I don't have their the authors' names in front of me again, but they're excellent, excellent resources, and uh, they're some of the best resources I know out there. There's uh, okay. some, also some wonderful new books out that I haven't read, but I understand are very good. One's called Red Hot Monogamy. So really how to keep a monogamous marriage but make it red hot. That's okay. been an excellent new resource as well. So fortunately for us today in the church, we have some wonderful resources. It's no longer the big unspoken you know, taboo subject. It, it, people are getting educated. They're talking about things. And the resources out there are just growing and growing to really help us. So now another thing that I, I really find it hard to believe, but I could kind of see how it would happen, is that sometimes women can use sex to manipulate her husband into giving her things. Mm. And I think it's very, it's an awful, an awful act because that's not what sex is for. But what advice do you have for women who have done this? They've done it knowing in the back of their mind, you know what, I want that pair of shoes and I know I can get it if I just give it up to my husband. What can you say to a woman who has done that? Just to stop because it is so unhealthy. And basically what it is is you're, you're, you're controlling you're, you're allowing uh, yourself to control the relationship and manipulating your husband. And, you know, over time, that's going to make him feel <clears throat> like a tool and disrespected and really may not even want to have a physical, sexual relationship with you. Um, because even though I think in a woman's mind we think, oh, you know, um, this man just wants to have the physical release. But honestly, the most important thing to a man in lovemaking is how you enjoy his lovemaking. 
he's asking himself two important questions. Am I performing well? And because of how I perform, are you drawn to me? He is more interested in bringing you fulfillment than experiencing fulfillment for himself. Because he'll always be able to have the orgasm. But he simply wants you to enjoy what you're experiencing, whether you're having an orgasm or not. He still wants you, he wants to know that you're enjoying being with him. So if you're just going to bed with your husband with this idea of, well, if I, if I make love to my husband, then I'm going to be able to get this, this, and that, he's going to know that. And, and that's just going to destroy uh, the intimacy, this into me see relationship that you both need and uh, both desire in your relationship. And uh, it's just so unhealthy. You just have to ask the Lord to give you the strength and the ability to, to love him unconditionally and to um, have sacrificial love. That, that's huge in a marriage. I think if, if, we could, if we could follow that principle of putting each other first and not having anything, not being motivated by selfish ambition, uh, I don't think our marriages would struggle. But, you know, our, it's just an area that most people just sort of slowly drift into self-centeredness and we... It's a struggle, but we need every day ask God to help us put our husband's needs ahead of our own. And our husbands have to pray, God, give me the ability to serve my wife. Now, we talked briefly about a woman's past sexual history, whether she was abused as a child, raped, molested, um, or whether she was just prom promiscuous. Maybe she even looked at some Playboy books. Some, a friend introduced her to that, and that was her idea of sex. How can a woman deal with these things in her relationship if she has gone through these things and she's struggling? Because a lot of times that kills the intimacy, too, not having gotten over your past. What advice do you have for a woman who has gone through some of these things? Well, I also experienced some sexual abuse when I was a five-year-old girl. And I can tell you that your perce your perception of sex, whether you're promiscuous or been sexually abused, is altered. You don't, it's shaded. You don't think of a man as being necessarily a loving, kind, thoughtful, um, serving person in the sexual arena. So it's, it's altered. And I think the most important thing is to get some sort of good, godly counsel. Uh, for those who have been sexually abused, Dr. Dan An Allender has a great book called Wounded Heart. I think it really is a tremendous resource. But um, I think getting some good, godly counsel is very important. Uh, and including your husband in all of this, being open with him, being honest with him, telling him the areas in which you struggle, and telling him that it has nothing to do with him, but that these are uh, this is an area of struggle because of. So don't don't keep secrets. Don't let those secrets mm. eat away at you and think, well, if I my husband's not going to understand, or he's not going to love me. <clears throat> Honesty is so important in your relationship. Um, otherwise, I think you will emotionally shut down as a woman. And you might go through the act, but you will be emotionally shut down. And that's not what God wants for you. He wants you to enjoy this physical aspect of your marriage. And he wants you to have that intimate relationship with your husband. So talk to your husband. Get some good counseling. And, and pray together. Be honest, be open, and uh, work through it. It's possible to get out and on the other side with help. What would be the most effective but non-threatening way for a woman to initiate a conversation about sex and intimacy with her husband, Pam? I think the most non-threatening way would be to begin praying together about it and asking the Lord to help you. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you can begin by doing that individually, just seeking God to help you in your conversation with your husband. Um, 
asking God to give you a willingness to listen and understand what he has to say. And then I believe praying together is a very important non-threatening way to begin. I think when you pray together over any issue, you're including the Lord in your conversation. You're including the Lord in allowing the Holy Spirit to take over. And it's, it's hard to be hypocritical um, when you're in that situation. It's much easier to be honest and trusting. So I always think we should pray first individually with the Lord, asking him for help and the timing, and then to go to our husbands and to ask, you know, there's a, I'd like to pray about our physical sexual relationship because I want it to be the best that God wants it to be. So I'd like us to begin to pray about that together as a couple. And um, and then I think conversation can probably flow from that. If it doesn't, I, I think you can you can hopefully seek out and get a mentoring couple, another couple who's older than you, more experienced than you, someone to come alongside of you to help you, uh, somebody you can bounce your questions off of, someone who can give you godly advice, someone who can pray for you. Uh, sometimes having that third party is, is also a very good non-threatening way to, um, to bring up conversation on, on, a, on a subject that you might feel uncomfortable about. And we really appreciate you, Pam, for being with us today. Oh, um, it's such a pleasure. I've just gotten so I've just gotten to enjoy getting to know you, Tiffany, really and truly. And I'm so glad that we had a chance to meet personally at the conference because uh, that was special. And I'm just so excited about what you're doing for marriages out there. And we'll be really praying that uh, you will have great impact for the kingdom of God. Well, thank you so much, Pam. And do you have any final words that you'd like to share with that woman who could be listening and she's heard the things that you have to say and, and she just doesn't know where to start because there's so many things that we can do, but what would be the first thing? You talked about prayer. You talked about reading books. You talked about talking with the husband. But where would be a very place within, let's say, these next 20 minutes that she could start right now to rebuild her sexual intimacy within her marriage? Well, I think, again, just praying that God would give her, it just ignite her, uh, her passion for her husband. To think, like, if this is the last day on, the, on earth that I would ever spend with him, wouldn't I want to hold him in my arms? Wouldn't I want to express, uh, openly express love to him? And I think just begin to verbalize those words to him. And so often, as we begin to verbalize um, loving thoughts and loving words to our husband, we'll begin the feelings will begin to uh, ignite. I, I do believe that if you look at each day as, as, as your possible last day, you, you'll act and respond differently to your husband and to other people around you just to appreciate the fact that you have this day to express love and appreciation for somebody, and especially for that person that you know, that, that you're married to. Gary Thomas wrote a book called Sacred Marriage, and um, I love what he had to say in that. He says, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? He says, let your relationship with your husband point you to what you really need most of all, and that's God's love and active presence in your life. So we begin with that love relationship with the Lord. Make sure that's intact. Pursue and seek a deep, abiding, close relationship with Jesus Christ. And he will be the taproot that will allow you, as you experience his unconditional love for you, it will allow you and free you up to uh, express unconditional love to your husband. And uh, that really is the key, is first your relationship with the Lord and letting that flow out into your relationship with your husband and then uh, allowing God to work in a way that you possibly can never even imagine. But he said that he is willing to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. 
so it's in him we do put our trust. Well, Pam, thank you so much for being with us today. We have definitely enjoyed, and and we'll, like I said, ladies, we'll have a list of these books on sex and intimacy uh, on the site, and we'll also have some information about uh, the Family Life Ministry and the Weekend to Remember. Thank you so much, and you have a blessed day. And start rebuilding on that sex and intimacy. God bless you.